Church, you were singing good today. I tell you what, man, that was good stuff. You know, we're going to be continuing our sermon series entitled Mixed Emotions. And, and this whole month, what we've been doing is we've been talking about how Jesus himself, the emotions that he felt, but also how he handled those emotions. You know, we talked about, uh, we talked about anxiety and the anxiety that Jesus felt as he was preparing to go to the cross. We talked about anger and the anger that he felt in the temple for those who were being denied. And today, church, what we want to talk about is something I believe a lot of us struggle with, and it's emotional pain. You know, there's a big difference between physical pain and emotional pain. I, I believe we live in a time in, in our world right now where so many people are dealing with emotional pain. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 tells us this. We've heard this every single week, and, and I want you to apply this to our emotions because sometimes we're tempted to use our emotions in the wrong way. It says this. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. <clears throat> Church, you know, every single one of us, whether you recognize it or not, we've all dealt with some emotional pain. Maybe right now you're sitting here in church or you're watching at home online and you're going through a really tough time. I'm talking about a tough Tough time in your life. Maybe it's your family is, is splintered or distracted. Maybe you're having a really hard time with your job or maybe even finding a job. Maybe your finances are in complete disarray. Or maybe you yourself, you're struggling personally. And you are feeling some emotional pain. Maybe it's some decisions you made in the past or decisions you are happening that you're making right now. Maybe right now as you sit here, you're feeling some pain in the church through what the church has been through. You know, we as individuals have been through a lot through the pandemic, but the church itself has also been through a lot. And so whatever it might be, church, we have all been experiencing some emotional pain in our lives. And so we go through these things. And how many times as you're going through it do you say, what's the purpose? You know what I'm talking about, church? Where you say, what is the purpose? Or, or you've asked God. Maybe you even haven't asked God. And, and, and you say, like, what is the purpose in all that I'm going through? God. God, why am I going through this? And what happens too often, church, is we just don't see the purpose. We don't see any purpose of what we're going through in, in church. I want to tell you something today. There is a reason. When we're going through things, there is a reason. I've heard people say before, that people hate pain, that people hate pain. I, I know a guy who, who I've known for a quite a long time. He's a, he loves tattoos. If, if you can possibly be addicted to tattoos, I'd say he is. I don't know if that's possible or not. But this dude loves tattoos and, and, and he'll show me his tattoos and I'm like, hey dude, I got a new one. And you know, and he had this one tattoo on, on the, the, the inside of his arm. That real tender spot, you remember when you were acting bad in church, your mom used to grab it and pinch real hard to calm you down? That tender spot in your arm, well, you know what? He got a tattoo there, and I'm like, dude, that had to hurt. He said, man, it did, but it was worth it. He said, because I love what it turned out to be. So he felt that the pain was worth it. And you know what, church? Sometimes when we're going through pain, it can be worth it, right? Sometimes when we go through pain, it can be worth it. And some people endure a lot of pain. They can endure a whole lot of pain as long as there is a purpose in it. As long as there's a purpose with the pain. And so people don't necessarily hate pain. They hate pain with no purpose. They hate pain that has no purpose. And if there isn't a purpose attached to the pain, then what happens, church, you and I, we struggle with it. And we say, I just don't see the point. And people can endure a lot of pain if there is a purpose. Some people, I find this so funny, some people pay a lot of money to be in pain, don't they? <laughs> they pay a whole lot of money to be in pain, to experience pain. And I think it's crazy. You think about all the things that can cause you pain, and at times, we'll pay for it. You know, if you're a marathon runner, okay, <laughs> I've never run in a marathon before, but I'm sure it can be painful, right? You pay money and you train and you go in and I bet you around mile three, man, it starts getting real painful. 
You know, maybe then it goes on to four, five, six, all the way to 26. And it can be very painful. And people will pay to run in this race because you know why, church? There's a payoff. I ain't talking about prize money. There's a payoff because of the performance. Maybe, just maybe, it's that sense of accomplishment. Maybe, just maybe, it's because they, they reached a goal that they've always wanted to reach this goal. And so there was a payoff to the pain. You know, maybe it's the training that, that you enjoy that, that training time. And, and, and I have a, a, a buddy of mine, he runs marathons. I used to work with him in my old job. And, you know, he'll be sitting there telling me, yeah, man, and, and around this point here, I was really feeling it. And then there was this one hill I went up and it was wild on this hill. I'm like, yeah, I drove up that hill many times. I didn't notice anything wild about that, you know. But in his mind, it was like he's telling me all these details about the hill that he ran up. And there's, so there's that training, that camaraderie that happens. What about some people who've been on drugs, right? They've been on drugs and, and they suddenly realize, they get to that point, like, I'm tired of living this life. You know, I, I don't want this anymore. They need a change. And, and what happens, church, if they go through um, this horrible time of detox, I've never been on drugs, but I heard the detox is like excruciating and it's awful. But you know what, church? For the payoff, it's their sobriety, they have a brand new life, and they say that it's worth it. It's worth it to go through that pain of detox to have the life that they can have again and the freedom from the chains that they would have been addicted to on those drugs. Maybe, church, think about this, all you ladies out there. I don't want to leave the ladies out, okay? Childbirth, right? You go through that, that, that childbirth, and, and, you know, there's this pain. From what I hear, it's serious pain. When, when my wife had Joshua, I, I was I was a dumb puppy. I had no idea what was going on. Two in the morning, and she's, hurry up, we got to get there. I'm going real slow to get to the hospital. And I remember she, she went in there, the delivery room, the doctor told her, push. And she pushed one time. And then he said, I need you to push again. She went, I can't. <laughs> yeah, because it was so painful for her. She didn't want to deal with that. But you know what happened, church? There was a payoff. She went through all that pain, and, and, and my son was delivered, and, and the doctor placed him in Mary's arms, and she's sitting there just looking at him, and, and how beautiful, and you know, you, you guys know what I'm talking about. So there was that serious pain, but there was that payoff, a child that you can love and, and cherish and, and raise, and you just look into its eyes while you're holding them and feeding them, and you're like, this is absolutely amazing, and then suddenly they become a teenager, and they lip off to you, and you're like, it wasn't worth it anymore, right? <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. People don't hate pain, church. They hate pain with no purpose. See, people can endure a lot of pain if there's a purpose. And how many of you guys right now, you're living in a season in your life. I'm talking you are in a season of your life where, where it's very painful out there for you. And it's a season of uncertainty. Isn't uncertainty painful? Because you don't know what's going to happen next. You don't know where things are going to go. And you worry and you wonder and you just keep going on and on and on. And you can't see a lot of good in it, can you? Of not knowing what tomorrow is going to bring. There's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of weariness. There's a lot of pain. But I want you to know this morning, church, there is purpose. Listen to me. There is purpose in your pain. There is a reason, there is a purpose, there is a provision from your heavenly father for the pain that you are going through. Today I want to share with you a text, and if you'll look at it with me, if you'll turn to Luke chapter 22, and, and you know, this is Jesus speaking here, and you know what, this verse, I remember reading it for the first time and, and actually comprehending what was going on here, and I remember I was frustrated with this, I'm like, you got to be kidding me, Jesus. I didn't like this verse. I really didn't like this verse because Jesus was talking to Simon, who later became Simon Peter, right? You ever notice in the Bible what, how God would change the names of people? It happened all through the Bible, right? So that they, they would give them a brand new identity or a new title, right? Because they become a different person, right? There was Abram, and, and, and God changed his name to Abraham, which means father of many. There was Sarai, right? God changed her name to Sarah. It means mother of nations. There was Simon, who was changed to Peter. It means God has heard, or the rock. And then we know, of course, Saul to Paul. And so I started thinking about my name. You know, what if God would let me change my name, or what if God would give me a new name? So I said, I'm going to pick out my own. 
I want to pick Kawan. You know why? It means this, huge, strong arms. But I want God to back it up, okay? I want, I want that name to have purpose for me. But let's look at Luke chapter 22. In Luke 22, verse 31, this is Jesus speaking. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. Now think about this for a minute. Jesus is coming up to Simon, who's later Peter, right? And he says to him, he says, you know what? The devil has asked me permission to wreak havoc in your life. He wants to try to hurt you. So now you understand why this verse frustrated me. The devil comes to Jesus and says, hey, your boy, Simon, Peter, or whatever you want to call him, I'm asking you for permission to do some nasty stuff to him, to, to test him, to, to put him through some trials, right? And so Jesus could have said, and this is the part of the bottom, Jesus could have said, you know what, Peter, you know what? You're going to be harassed. You are going to be humiliated. You are going to struggle. You will fall short. And this season will be more difficult than any season you've ever experienced in your life. And check out Luke chapter 22, verse 32. And this is Jesus again. He says, but I've prayed for you, Simon that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And so right here, think about this, church. The devil comes to Jesus, wants permission to attack Simon, and Jesus says, hey, I gave him permission. And I, that always blew my mind. And not only did he say, hey, I gave him permission, but I'll be praying for you. And think about that. See, to me, I would expect Jesus to skip the prayers and go, like, kick the devil's tail up the street for me. That's what I would think should happen. But the devil asked, can I attack him? And notice Jesus didn't cause it, church. This is where a lot of us make mistakes. Jesus didn't cause this mess. He did not cause it, but for whatever reason, he allowed it. He didn't cause it, but he allowed it. And he said, hey, I'm going to be praying for you, Simon. I'll be, I'll be praying for you as the, the enemy comes to you. I'm sure, church, some of you right now, you feel like you're under attack. You personally, you're sitting here in church or you're watching at home and you really and truly, you're feeling like you are under attack and, and, and you're thinking like, when is this gonna stop? How much more can I take, right? You know, there are people who are sick, church. There are people who, who are losing their jobs or businesses closing down. There are families in turmoil. I mean, we could go on and on all day long about what's going on and we sit there and we say, man, when will things ever get to normal, right? We're looking for that. Maybe this morning you're praying for God to su supply someone to you to do life with. You're, you're tired of being alone. Maybe, maybe you, you, you are asking God, you're pleading with God to, because you are unemployed and you can't pay your bills. Maybe you're underemployed. Maybe you feel like your marriage is falling apart. Maybe as a parent, you feel like you are lacking and you've done nothing but screw things up. But think about it, church. Whenever it feels like the devil is attacking you, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter what the reason is, I want you to remember something. I want you to remember this. Sometimes God's preparation comes packaged as pain. If you're writing stuff down, I want you to write that down. It's so important. Sometimes God's preparation comes packaged as pain. You want to talk about a tongue twister. That was a hard one to say. <laughs> Lots of peas in there. Church, you realize there's a purpose in your pain? There really is. There is a purpose in your pain. God may be, may be using this difficult time to do something in you so that he can then in turn do something through you. Too many times we act like them little kids, right? Like, why well, is everything bad always happened to me? My life stinks. This is terrible, right? We go on and on and on. And your pain, church, may be preparation for what God has planned for you. That might be what you're going through right now. Check out that story with, with Simon Peter. I'm not sure how you feel, but, but, but Simon Peter, you know, when I read about Peter in the Bible, that dude makes me feel good. You know why? Because he screws up way more than I do. <laughs> he, does, he, he, he would make me feel bad. You know, how many of you have a friend in your life that you keep around because, you know what, they, they make you feel better. They make you look good because your friend, no matter what you do, your friend is always doing something stupider, right? <laughs> the, Kelly Clark is stupider, proper English, I don't know. All right, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I butchered all the time anyways. But the devil comes to Peter, and he attacks him. And you know what? 
He attacks him. And how do you think Peter handled that? Jesus said, hey, he asked for permission. I gave it to him. I'm praying for you, man. I hope it works out well for you. The devil comes to Peter and attacks him. And I want to show you something, church. I want to show you some of the high points of Peter's failures. Man, you think you mess a lot of stuff up? Check this out. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus comes to his disciples. He says, God sent me to die. He said, I came here. This is my mission. This is what I got to do. And on the third day, I'll be raised. And Peter, what did Peter do? He rebuked Jesus. He rebuked Jesus for why he came. And, and what did he say? He said, Lord, no, I'm not letting that happen. And what did Jesus say to Simon Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Let me tell you right now, when Jesus calls you Satan, <laughs> that's pretty bad. That's a pretty big deal. So Jesus is declaring his divine calling. Peter said no. How about in the garden, right? Remember when Jesus was praying in the garden of Gethsemane and he comes to his disciples, he says, hey, I need you to stay awake. I need you to stay alert. Watch. I want you to watch. Jesus went along and prayed and he comes back. There's Simon Peter right there laying there sleeping. When Jesus told him not to, in John chapter 18, Jesus, remember when he, he was arrested by, by the soldiers, right? And Jesus was getting ready to do what he said he came to do. Peter jumps up, he draws his sword, and he swings, aiming at the dude's head. He misses the mark, cuts off his ear. And then Jesus is like, calm down, Peter, put your sword away. You know, I'm here for a purpose. Hey, somebody help me find that ear, you know? Imagine that. <laughs> But church, and then when Jesus prophesied that Peter would deny him, he said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, oh, no, Lord, you can always count on me. I'd die for you. And the Bible goes on to tell us, right, that on the third time when he denied Jesus, Jesus and Peter looked in each other's eyes. I mean, front row seat, there it was. And can you imagine? The Bible says this. It says that Peter went away and he wept bitterly. Imagine this, church. Imagine Peter going through all these things. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly his thoughts on that. But can you imagine? I'm a failure, right? I didn't do it right. I can't handle it. I screwed it all up. And maybe, church, some of you are feeling that way right now. You're, you're dealing with some emotional pain because you've messed some things up. You're like, I'm a failure. I can't even live this Christian life right uh, every single time I say I'm going to commit myself and then the very next day I fall short and I go back to my old habits. And, you know, remember what Paul said, right? The things I shouldn't do, I do. And the, thing, you know, the things I should do, those are the things I don't. You know how it goes. Maybe you're struggling with situations in your life and you're failing miserably. What does it do, church? It causes us pain. You know, you let God down. You, you stumbled. You, 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 you fell. And then you start to think, like, this Christian walk isn't easy. Like, I, I don't know if I, I, I can do this. It's so difficult to be motivated, isn't it, church, when, you're, when you keep struggling and you keep falling short. And, and we, we think those thoughts, you know, I'm supposed to be a, a Christian. I'm supposed to have the fruits of the Spirit, right? The fruits of the Spirit should be in me. And that's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, right? But the only fruits that I've got in my life are, are anger, right? The anxiety, frustration, those are the only anger. I mean, those are the only fruits that I'm showing. And, and then it takes you to this place, right, where you just feel it's not worth it and you're depressed and, and you go home and eat a whole family bag of M&Ms and a whole can of Pringles and you're just getting started, right? You know what? You sit there and think like everybody else is doing well. Everybody else is enjoying fellowship and everybody's enjoying time with their family and, and you can't even stand your family. You know, you want to play hide and go seek with your family, but you don't want anyone to come look for you, right? You just want to make your family disappear. Church, listen to me. Where was God at in all of Peter's failures? Where exactly was God in Peter's failures? failures. Where was God in the middle of Peter's pain? There was a purpose, church. There was a purpose and there was a reason. Sometimes God's preparation comes packaged as pain. And not only for Peter, but for you and me. But you know what we do, church, is we get in that mode, don't we? 
we get in that mode where we're feeling sorry for ourselves and, and we start struggling, we start hurting and, and we say, you know, th- look at what I've lost and, and, and this is what I used to have and, and this is what I wanted to do and these, nothing ever works out for me. And, but listen, don't look at it that way. Don't just look at your life from a perspective of pain. And too many of us were in a habit of doing that. We only look at our lives from that perspective of pain and where you're at. See, you need to see your pain. You need to see your pain from a perspective of purpose. That there is a purpose in it. God might be doing something, church. He might be doing something in you. And before he does something in your life, you got to be able to recognize it to receive it. He might be doing something in you so he can do something through you. And the difficult thing that you're going through, I want you to get this this morning, church. It is not without purpose. God may have allowed this to happen to you. Just maybe he allowed this to happen to you to strengthen you that only in a way that pain can strengthen you. That's the only way it can happen. You guys remember what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, Paul, right? See? And, 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 and listen, church, and we know that in all things, and we know that in all things, I want you to get that this morning. It says everything, all things that you got going on. So, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Notice that, church, it says in all things. So in your failures, in your struggles, in your mistakes, remember, and we know that in all things, God works for the good. God is working for the good for those who love him and called according to what? His purpose, church. It's his purpose. Too many of us, we think it's our purpose. (laughs) It's his purpose. It's completely his purpose purpose. It's according to God's purpose. It's not according to your pain. It's according to God's purpose. And I want us to do something, church. I want us to change our perspective. Seriously, I want us all to change our perspective on how we look at life uh, and see how God is working even in the middle of our pain. But too many times you can't see how God's working because you're not even looking. You're just focusing on that pain. I know some of you are thinking like, you know what? You, you have no idea what I'm going through. I really, I really don't. I don't. You may be saying like, preacher, you, you don't even understand how I feel. Uh, maybe I don't. Some of you, maybe you're saying, oh, it's really easy for you, preacher boy, because your life is so good in your little preacher world. I got it rough too, guys. We're all in this together. But you know what? You sit there and say, like, I'm really struggling. I believe you are. You're sitting there saying, like, I'm really hurting. (laughs) I believe that you are. Maybe, though, this very thing that you dread the most, God is going to use to develop you. The very thing that that you wish never would have happened, the very thing that you're pleading and begging God to take away, do you realize that God might use it to develop you? Maybe, just maybe, the stronger the pain, the bigger the purpose that God has for you in your life on the other side of that pain, church. There's another verse that sometimes frustrates me. (laughs) James chapter one, verse two and four, two through four. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And church, that verse always used to tick me off. I'm like, woohoo, I'm having trouble, right? You're excited. No. It goes on to say this. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. The testing of your faith will produce perseverance. It means it's building it up. It's making it stronger so that you can persevere. And then it says this, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If you ask my wife, the things that bug her the most about me, she'll give you a long list, but in the top five <laughs> is that I start a lot of projects I don't finish. You know what I'm talking about? You look at my house, there's all kinds of little projects I start here, there, and everywhere. And, and, and she's always like, you know what? Why are you starting that? Why don't you finish this one over here and that one over there? And that? I'm like, get off my back, woman. You know what I mean? <laughs> but you know what? 
It's kind of like baking the cake and not putting the icing on it. You know, the icing is the best part of that cake. And sometimes, church, when we're going through our pain and our struggle, the Bible says, let perseverance finish its work. God's saying, I want to finish something in you. I want to complete it. I want to make it right. I want to make it to where I planned it. And so it says, let perseverance finish its work in you so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And that's what God wants to do in your life. Church, I want to take you back to Luke chapter 22. Now that I've thrown a lot at you there, I want us to read that verse again. Luke chapter 22, verse 30. 1 and 32. It says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all as wheat. And it says, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Did you hear what he said there, church? He says, and when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. It means like when you made it through, When you got to the other side, you know what? You got something to do. You can help strengthen someone else. When you turn back, strengthen your brothers. And when you do, church, when you get over that struggle, when you get over that pain, when you are over the heartache, when you're over all these things, when you turn back, it means you can strengthen your brothers and you may be be more prepared for God's purpose for your life. His purpose Church, I tell you what, I'm a very purposeful guy. I'm very, very, I mean, everything I do, everything I say, I'm very, very intentional, very purposeful. They teach you that in salesman school, okay? And, and you know what? I know when I'm doing something, there's a plan and a purpose to it. My boys, I tell you what, all the time, when I would say we're going to do something, you know, I'd say, hey, we're going to move this pile of rocks. They never liked it. But I wouldn't tell them why. You know, we're going to move these pile of rocks. And we're like, for what? <laughs> I'm like, because we're going to, because I told you to, right? And then they always give you that famous line with a teenager say, that's stupid. <laughs> we're going to move these rocks, and, and we're going to move them out. Yeah, that's stupid, Dad. I'm like, I don't care. Get working. I told you to. I'm your dad. That's why we brought you in this world. I needed extra hands at home to work, so that's why you're here. So you start moving the rocks. And you know what? They'll start moving these rocks begrudgingly, and they'll start doing the work that I asked them to do. And then along the way, what I'll start doing is showing them slowly, here's what the purpose is. Here's why we're doing it. And you know what, church? God does the same thing in your life. He sends you on a path. He takes you in a direction. He's not always going to tell you what the purpose is. And we're so nosy. We're like, God, I don't want to start it until you tell me what's going to happen. He will take you down that path. And he will reveal to you step by step what the purpose is. In each and every one of us, church, when we realize what is it God's doing, When we turn back, it is up to us to strengthen our brothers and sisters. When you do, when your struggle is over, when your heartache is over, when your pain is over, you strengthen those around you. And and, and I love when when Jesus Jesus says here to Simon Peter, he says, hey, devil's going to take care of you. He's going to whoop on you. But I'm praying for you. The very thing, church, the very thing that your spiritual enemy wants to do to hurt you, God's saying, you know what? I'm going to use that to strengthen you. I'm going to make you stronger with that. And then when you turn back, you'll be stronger for my purpose. I strengthened you for my purpose. Not your purpose, church, but for his purpose. He's going to strengthen you to do what it is that he called you to do. And so the pain, church, the pain was preparation. And so after the resurrection, think about this. After the resurrection of Jesus, once he appeared out of the tomb, appeared to his disciples, after he fulfilled his purpose and went through all his pain, you realize all of Jesus' pain had a purpose too? For us? So after he fulfilled all of his pain for his purpose, and when God raised him from the dead, you realize, church, the first person to preach, the very first person to preach on the power of the resurrection and the power of forgiveness was Simon Peter. Because after he turned, he strengthened his brothers and his sisters. 
when he said, repent of your sins, when he preached, when Peter preached at Pentecost, the pain, the church, the pain was the preparation to preach at Pentecost. And do you realize this? When he said, repent of your sins so you can be forgiven, because he knew, Peter knew exactly what that meant. He knew exactly what it meant to be forgiven. And you know what, church? The Bible tells us this. 3,000 people came to know Jesus that one day. You know what? I'm a preacher. I'm a preacher. When I, one person comes forward to want to get, woohoo! you know, we had a great day at church. Can you imagine 3,000 people coming forward? I mean, your arm would be tired dunking all them people all day long, wouldn't it? But how exciting is that? God was doing something. Church, God was doing something in the middle of Peter's pain. Church, you might not always see it. We might not always see it. But church, by faith, we must choose to believe it. You might not always see it, but by faith, you have to choose to believe it. God, you should be praying, church. God, give me eyes. Give me eyes, Lord, so I can see the purpose in this pain I'm going through. Father God, I choose to believe what it is that you're sending me through. So how many of you would agree? How many of you would agree that when you're going through painful times, when you're hurting emotionally, painfully, that one day can seem like six weeks, doesn't it? It's awful. When I'm going through those things, I always have to remind myself, today is not forever, today is not forever, today. It'll be over tomorrow, right? It'll be different, I'll have a different perspective. You know, how many of you had to quarantine at any time during this pandemic? You know, that happened to me very early. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. When I had to quarantine, it was awful because it was hard. I had to stay at home and I looked at the same two other people for 14 days. I can't even tell you how they felt about me. <laughs> but I sat there and, we, and we, we had a really hard time. In church, I would battle with depression during that. And I was struggling because I'm not a sit around kind of guy. And I hated not having purpose. But you know what? But God gave me purpose in that pain. He kind of opened my eyes a little bit and he said, hey, you know what? This is a great time for you to draw closer to me. You know, focus on me a little bit here. You know, I had time to think. I had time to plan. You know, I, 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 was, I was planning out sermon series and things and, and, and this was hard because we didn't have physical church at the time. And so, you know, after I started playing and I started slipping that, that problem, like, well, this is all for nothing. You know what I'm talking about? And you know what, church? As leader of the church, and, and I tell you, I believe the rest of the leadership of this church can feel the same way and they'd agree with me. A leader of the church is called the shepherd. That's why we're called shepherds, right? We're called the shepherd. But during this time, when we weren't meeting, when we weren't meeting and, and, and you realize the, the gate to the sheep pen was open and sheep began to wander. They were wandering and they were going places they didn't need to be. And you know, church, do you realize that there are wolves out there that are just waiting to pick you off? Do you realize there are wolves that are out there to, to, to devour you when you wander off, to steal from you, to hurt you, to, to rob your family of all the things? And church, in the time that we were separated, people started creating habits that were not good. People start doing things they know they shouldn't be. There was a, a little guy that goes to this church. His dad knows I'm going to tell this story, but there's a little guy that goes to this church. I saw him at Walmart. And I, hey, Jimmy, I miss you at church. He goes, smile real big, innocently, very innocently. He says, oh, we don't go to church anymore. We do fun stuff on Sunday. <laughs> really? I tell you what, I called his dad the next day and told him what his boy said. And they were in church the next Sunday. <laughs> But you know what, seriously, it's truth. We all started wandering. People started wandering and, and all of a sudden you replace God with, with things that shouldn't be there, right? And it wrecks me, church. It really does, it wrecks me because I know, I know I, I'm gonna see a purpose through all this. Everything that all of us have gone through, there will be a purpose. I don't see it right now, but we will see that purpose. It's coming. God will reveal it to us. But church, you know what? I want you to know something. If you look at life with just any snapshot, just a quick picture, 
You know what I'm talking about. Instagram, Facebook, all you guys, you, you hashtag best life, you know what I mean? And you're, you fake smile for a quick second, and you're looking at, you know, at the beach, and then you go back to your mopey self, and you know you do that. <laughs> and you look at any part of your life in a snapshot. Do you realize, church, you can easily miss what God's doing because you focus on that one negative thing maybe, that one struggle, when you know what, there's, there's thousands of snapshots in that whole film of your life, and you look at that one thing and, and you could be missing it. You, can't, you could be missing what it is and it's easy to become disillusioned, and then you start that, that issue in your life, like, you know, God, where are you at? Where is God? Where is he? What is your purpose? I don't see a purpose, and what good could possibly come out of what I've been going through? If you look at any single snapshot in your life, it is very easy to miss what God is doing. Because if you take one instance of your life, a difficult time you went through, and then five years later you kind of look at it, and you're like, oh, I see what you're doing, God. I didn't see it then. And Lord, forgive me because I was angry at you but I now see what it is that you were doing. Church, there is purpose in the middle of the pain, but we must look through a lens that God has given you to see that purpose. So what will it be for you, church? As we're sitting here, what will it be for you? Some of you are angry. Some of you are frustrated. Some of you are maybe even worn out. Sometimes the greater the pain, church, remember, the greater the purpose. Is it hard sometimes? Yes, it is. It's very difficult. But on the other side of this pain, there can be something amazing for you. And you realize with our God, there is always a purpose. I want you to get that, church. With our God, there is always a purpose. You know what? Maybe everything we've just gone through is going to knock you out of your spiritual complacency. I believe the church is spiritually complacent. You're just like, eh, whatever. Maybe what we've gone through can knock you out of your spiritual complacency. Maybe, church, it can take you out of your comfort zone. Just maybe, you know what? Maybe it'll knock you off your self-sufficiency because you think you can do this all by yourself and you don't need God. It'll take you to a place you can sink clear down. It'll take you to that place where all of a sudden, church, you have nowhere else to go but to look up and to call on your God and say, I need you now. I need you now. Church, he wants to draw you closer to him. He wants to bring you in. Our God, church, is, our God is working, right? He is working in all things for the good, for those who love him and call according to his purpose. And I know with everything in me, church, that God will show his faithfulness. That God is going to show his faithfulness, but look for it, search for it, it's there. And when you turn back, church, when you turn back, I want to remind you, you strengthen your brothers and your sisters. You know what that means? You say, let me tell you what my God has done in my life. Amen. You give him praise, you give him glory, you tell people you meet, because church, with God, there is always a purpose. So as I ask the praise team to come up here today and we're wrapping this service up, I want to ask you a quick question. Who do you trust? Think about that for a minute. Who do you trust? Do you trust yourself? You really shouldn't. You realize your emotions lie to you all the time. You, you, you realize your thoughts can deceive you. Your heart can deceive you. When people always say, follow your heart, no, don't. Don't you dare follow your heart. It would deceive you. You follow, you follow God. And for those of you who don't see anything good in your life right now, for those of you who don't see God working, I pray that God's gonna reveal it to you today. Right here while we're sitting here, that God's gonna reveal it to you today. People hate pain, I know that, but you know what? People hate pain without purpose. But God wants to show you the purpose. He wants to show you what it is he's doing. And we can endure pain, church. We can endure a lot of pain as long as we know there is a purpose. And today I stand here on this stage and I tell you, church, there is a purpose. Amen. I'm going to wrap up the service and share one last verse with you. It comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. And it says this. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus 
the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in a place of honor besides God's throne. In church, do you realize what it says in the beginning of that verse? It says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. You want to find the purpose? You pay attention to him. Watch him. So how are you doing spiritually? How are you doing spiritually this morning? Some of you might say not good. I want to reaffirm to you this morning that our God is so good. Our God is so good. He is so loving. He not only loved on you from heaven, but he said, that's not enough. He said, I want to come down and love on you. I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. I want to be with you. And he sent his son, Jesus, right? To walk this earth so that every single one of us could have a hope for a future. And he endured the shame and the pain of that cross for a purpose so that every single one of us could have forgiveness of sins. And so church, this morning, maybe you're sitting here and you're like, I'm in a lot of pain. I believe that you are. Maybe this morning you're sitting here and you're having doubts about what good can become of this. I believe you can think that way. I've done it a hundred times. But I wanna remind you, God has a purpose but you gotta look to him for it. You're not gonna find any self-help books. You're not gonna find it to shrink. You're not gonna find it in your own circle of friends. God will show you the purpose. He might be doing something in you right now so he can do something through you later. So this morning, if you're struggling, maybe the reason you're struggling is because you are outside of Jesus Christ. You do not have a proper relationship with him. You know who he is because you've heard him or maybe if you've even said his name as a cuss word but he's so much more than that. His purpose for you was for you to have a close walk with him, an intimate walk. And it can only come through this. Our sin separates us from God. The only way that you can draw closer to him is to admit your sins, to admit that you're a sinner. You confess your sins unto him. You ask for forgiveness. You invite Jesus Christ in your heart. And then church, listen to me. You follow him in Christian baptism. I want to tell you, he will give you a brand new life. He will give you a brand new perspective. You will see differently. You will hear differently. You will even feel differently as long as you let him do the work that he wants to do. So this morning, if that is for you, I want to encourage you to come forth. There'll be elders on both sides of the stage. They would love to pray with you. If you need to make that decision, we'll do that today. And for the rest of you, church, for the rest of you, if you're just boo-hooing about all the pain you're going through, I'm not saying your pain's not real. Please don't. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But I want you to look for God's purpose and understand he's got something amazing on the other side of that pain. How about it, church? Let's stand together, but let's sing.